Thank you everyone at the Skyscraper Museum for having me here. Before we start, a couple of people I just wanted to, to, to thank. Um, Carol just mentioned a couple of them. Uh, Jonathan Wallen, um, who took all the beautiful photography. Also, um, his assistant, uh, Lester Ali, who joined us on a lot of the photo shoots. Lester's actually a very accomplished photographer in his own right and specializes in photographing skyscrapers all over the world. And then next to him, uh, Julian Fellows, Lord Fellows, who wrote the foreword to the book. And this was a book that took five years to put together. And at the very beginning of it, uh, Julian had finished Downton and there was this rumor that he was gonna be doing an American version. So I reached out to him, he agreed to write the foreword. And then after that, it was just very serendipitous that it would take um, me five years to finish a book and it would take him five years to finish what would become the Gilded Age. So um, first of all, what is the American Renaissance and what is Beaux-Arts architecture? So the American Renaissance, or as Mark Twain called it, the Gilded Age, I think if you're gonna use one word to describe it, it's opulence. Um, this is the library inside the University Club, um, designed by Charles McKim, and the ceiling was, was painted by Henry Siddons Mowbray. And, as Julian writes in the foreword, this is the first time really in America in history that Americans have more money than anybody else in Europe. It's a period right after the Civil War. America's changing from an agricultural society to an industrial society, becoming the world's foremost industrial power. And with that are all these technological advancements. We get the automobile, we get the electric light bulb, um, we get elevators, and most importantly, we get um, structural steel. So all of a sudden buildings no longer need to be load-bearing masonry. They can metaphorically and, and physically reach for the stars, um, which is what we'll talk about with some of the skyscrapers. And then Beaux-Arts architecture. Well, I think when most people think of that, they think of buildings like this New York Public Library by Carrera and Hastings in 1911. Um, they also think of Grand Central, terminal and they think of the Metropolitan Museum. But the term comes from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, um, which was an architecture school in Paris. The first American to go there was an architect called Richard Morris Hunt. And Hunt was really the foremost architect of this period. Um, in New York, very little of his work is left. The, ba uh, the base of the Statue of Liberty and the entrance to the Metropolitan Museum. But if you go up to Newport, you can see his work at the Breakers and Marble House. And if you go down to Asheville, North Carolina, you can see Biltmore. And he was followed by H.H. H. Richardson and then Charles McKim. And while they were in uh, Paris, they were taught the architecture of um, Roman antiquity. And so this is one building. This is Stanford White designed this. This is the Gold Memorial Library, which is in the Bronx. When this was built, it was actually part of the NYU campus up in the Bronx. But it also allowed, but they also taught the architecture of the Italian Renaissance. This is the outside of the University Club, like I said, by Charles McKim in the same year, 1899. And they came back to America and they kind of amalgamated all these styles together into what we call American Beaux-Arts. So that's why you can get all these different buildings of different styles all be under the same umbrella. So, and maybe Carol can debate me on this, but New York's first skyscraper is, you know, is, is probably this, it's the New, the New York World Building, um, uh, also known as the Pulitzer Building, built in 1890. Um, George Post was the architect, along with Richard Morris Hunt, who was the most prominent architect in the first half of the Gilded Age. And this was the first building to be built in New York City that was taller than Trinity Church. And they were able to take advantage of that with the uh, structural steel. And you can get your bearings, which was there right next to, to City, Hall, um, it was actually demolished in 1955 by Robert Moses uh, to create a additional uh, vehicular ramps to the, um, the Brooklyn Bridge. And 
just like Hunt, there's so little of post work left in New York City. Uh, the facade of the stock exchange is one. This is another. Uh, this is Williamsburg Savings Bank. Anybody who's been to Peter Luger's uh, would recognize this building. And this was built in 1875. It's really one of the first examples of Beaux-Arts architecture in uh, the entire country. And inside, it has this very kind of Victorian polygrammatic decoration. And I guess that's one of the points um, to think about is during this period, we're transitioning from picturesque Victorian architecture into classical architecture, and then at the end towards modernism. And just as the styles changed, the technology changed. And so when this was built, it was before the telephone had been invented. And so they used voice pipes like these to communicate um, throughout the building. And then City Hall Park. And so on the, in the foreground in front of us, you can see the Tweed Courthouse um, directly behind by the City Hall. To the left of that, you see the New York World Building. And then you get um, Newspaper Row, where you have the New York Tribune Building, the New York Times Building. And at the very tip of what is now City Hall Park, you see uh, what was uh, the City Hall Post Office, uh, which was demolished in 1939. Um, directly to the right of that is where the Woolworth Building would end up getting built. And in the background, you can see the very distinctive um, silhouette of the Singer Building. And there we are, Ernest Flag, 1908. This really technically is the first skyscraper. It's the first time that a building uh, would, would be this, this size. Um, the New York World Building was 18 floors and 309 feet. This was double the size. This was 41 floors and 612 feet. Um, it would be the world's tallest building for just one year. And of course it would be later demolished in 1967 and replaced by what is now the US Steel Building. And in the background, you can see the silhouette of the Woolworth Building. So Ernest Flagg, who designed the, um, the Singer Building, Again, very little of his work remains here in New York City. This is one of his buildings. And uh, this is on Great Jones Street, a beautiful firehouse that he did. And I think of all the American architects who studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, he's probably the one who kind of embodied um, the sense of French Beaux-Arts um, the most. And this building I was introduced to my very first weekend in New York City in the fall of 1996. And this is when I really fell in love with um, this style of architecture. So after the Singer building is the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company building in Madison Square. And to the left of it, the tower you see is the tower on the fabled Madison Square Garden designed by um, Stanford White. The Metropolitan Life Insurance Company building is still there. Um, built in 1909, 700 uh, feet tall, 50 floors. But in the 1960s, it was stripped of a lot of the beautiful ornament which it had on it. And that leads us to these two gentlemen, um, Frank Woolworth, and next to him is architect Cass Gilbert. And Frank Woolworth really is the rags to riches story of, um, of this time period. He grew up, and a very poor family in upstate New York. Um, opened his first five and dime store in 1879. And by the time he moved to New York in 1910, he had 600 stores. And what happened was he went to Europe uh, on vacation. And two things happened there. First of all, everyone kept on asking him about the Singer building, which was the tallest building at the time. And he realized, what a great piece of PR it would be to have the tallest building in the world and for anybody to know it. And then the second thing was he went to London and he discovered the Houses of Parliament, which had recently been completed, Big Ben, and fell in love with um, what we call perpendicular Gothic. 
And so he would come back from Europe and he would tell his architect, Cass Gilbert here, um, to build him the world's tallest building in the Gothic style. And this is kind of a famous view. You kind of see it um, historically. This is our little take on it. It's framed in the arches of the municipal building. And um, so this would be finished in 1913. It was uh, would remain the world's largest building until 1930. It's 792 feet tall. It wasn't the tallest structure in the world. It was the tallest building. Uh, at the time, the Eiffel Tower was still the tallest structure in the world. So there's a bit of a difference between structure and building. And um, the spire of the Woolworth building, uh, this is where it gets its famous nickname, the Cathedral of Commerce. Originally, the spire was gilded. It was uh, later replaced and now clad in green tile. And looking up at the front, I love this shot, looking up at the front of the building, you see all the beautiful, um, actually a combination of Indiana limestone and um, decorative terracotta panels with Gothic tracery. Later, a lot of the terracotta was replaced and started to disintegrate in the, the harsh weather that we have here and was later replaced with cast concrete panels that would weather a little bit better. And then the entrance to the building, um, I'm not sure how we managed to photograph this with no people in front of it, um, but there you go. And this beautiful, intricately carved um, Tudor portal. And as beautiful as the outside is, it, it leads into perhaps the greatest um, lobby of a, of a uh, skyscraper in New York City. Um, before 9-11, you could easily walk into the Woolworth building, not so much anymore, but you uh, walk in and the space, very hard to photograph because it's a very tight space. It's um, in the shape of a, of a Latin cross. The wings are only 15 feet wide um, to the top of the domes is 35 feet tall, but the ceiling is all clad in this glass uh, mosaic um, the walls are marble, which was imported from, from Greece. And there's two mezzanines um, on the south and the north side, which feature these wonderful allegorical um, murals. Uh, this one that we're looking at is Commerce, and she is grasping a globe and is flanked by the figures of, um, by figures holding a ship and a locomotive representing travel. And then directly opposite is labor, and she is uh, flanked by the figures of grain and fruit. Inside is this wonderful sculpture. Uh, some of it's quite, quite whimsical, these squirrels. The interesting thing is, although these appear to all be carved out of stone, they're actually cast out of plaster and were then so painted to make it look like it was stone. So they were always making an effort to make everything look more expensive than what it actually was. Uh, the elevator doors. This is a building that when fully occupied had 14,000 people. Um, so they had 24 high-speed Otis elevators, which at the time were the fastest elevators in the world. And they were beautifully hidden behind these, these beautiful doors, which are crafted out of bronze by um, Tiffany Studios. And then to the rear of the building, you get um, this banking hall. Now, one of the interesting things was we looked at the, the uh, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company building earlier when, Kath, um, when Frank Woolworth started his business, he went to them to get a loan, was denied. And so um, built the Woolworth building without taking out a mortgage, uh, which is pretty amazing. But there was this banking call for the Irving Bank, which he was one of the board members for. And this was the first time a building was built, skyscraper was built, so which had retail incorporated into it. So the retail stores not just opened onto the outside, but opened into the inside of the space as well. And then above um, the banking hall is this beautiful stained glass 
ceiling and in it there's some key dates uh there's the year that he started his business there's the year that the world building opened and then um there's the coats of arms of i believe it's 11 different countries which is where he had all of his um stores worldwide and then down at the entrance are these beautiful whimsical um corbels where somebody got to have a little bit of fun and again these were cast out of plaster but faux painted to look like they were part of the marble and here we have frank woolworth count, counting his his fives and his dimes and um and then one of cass gilbert his architect holding a model of the woolworth building and this would make cass gilbert the most famous architect in america and there's a quote that I wanted to just share with you. And he was writing to his friend, Ralph Adams Cram, and he said, I sometimes wish that I had never built the wall of building because it is regarded as my only work. And you and I both know that whatever it may be in dimension and certain lines, it is after all only a skyscraper. Uh, here's a little bit into insight of how people thought about skyscrapers back then. So, Heading south a little bit to just around the corner from where the Skyscraper Museum is, is Bowling Green. At the tip of Bowling Green is this building, the US Custom House. This was also designed by Cass Gilbert um, six years earlier. So very much in this grand monumental Beaux-Arts style. And uh, Bowling Green is terribly historic in, in America. It's the oldest park in New York City, found, um, created in, 1733 and outside the entrance to the to the custom house uh, these fantastic sculptures by uh, Daniel Chester French uh, titled the four continents they're probably um, the best collection of allegorical sculpture in um, in the entire country and then just quickly inside the building because people walk past it they don't go inside is one of the great spaces in New York City, uh, which is the Rotunda. And this building was incredibly important because back in the Gilded Age in the American Renaissance, there was no income tax. And so most of the revenue generated uh, by the US government was from uh, import tax. So everything came through this building in New York City. And this is if you were stood on the steps of the custom house looking north uh, at Bowling Green. This is an archival shot because you can't get this image anymore because the trees that um, are quite puny in this picture are quite robust now and, and block this view. But um, Bowling Green is, a, is this triangular shape and on all three sides, it is blessed with fantastic buildings. So to the south, we have the US Custom House and to the east, we have the Standard Oil Building, and to the west, we have the Cunard Building. And so this is the Standard Oil Building, um, designed by Carrera and Hastings in 1924. It's attributed to Carrera and Hastings, but it was really uh, built by two of their associates who worked there, uh, Shreve and Lam, who would later go on to design the Empire State Building, uh, 26 Broadway, 520 feet tall, 31 stories, and the late great historian Henry Hope Reed used to say that this was the most beautiful skyscraper in New York City, and um, I'm not going to argue with that. It's uh, absolutely stunning on the outside. What makes it interesting is it's massing, because, like we can go back, you can see it's this combination of a curving facade with a, um, a rectilinear block. And part of that is because they're replicating the curve of Broadway as it heads north. And then also the grid of lower Manhattan, which is what the skyscraper component is based on. And it also features a number of light wells and setbacks because this was built after the 1916 laws were brought in regarding lighting and ventilation. And on the corners of the 22nd floor, you just look up and you see all these beautiful details such as these obelisks. And then the tower itself was 13 stories tall um, with this kind of pyramid top, which is based on the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. And because this was a standard oil building, 
um, in kind of remembrance of, of how they'd made their money. Um, it had this beautiful kind of lantern, this cauldron on top, which was uh, lit up constantly by four kerosene lamps. Um, kind of when you came into port into New York City, this was the first thing you saw. It's like this grand lighthouse. Um, the kerosene lamps were turned off in the 50s. And I should say the Standard Oil building is actually not in the book. We photographed it. It's one of the few buildings that actually didn't make the cut. Um, we have 412 pages. We had to stop somewhere. And so unfortunately we didn't get to feature this, but this is the, the lobby. And this was one of the reasons, and it's a fine lobby, but this is one of the reasons why we didn't uh, include it because we wanted to include buildings that had an interior and an exterior. And, um, Really, the lobby is quite limited uh, in this building. What is in interesting, though, is it's kind of lower than the street level. You can see by those steps. So when you come in off Broadway, you come down, and that allows for this 40-foot tall um, interior lobby. And around the, the freeze is the names of all of the partners who, who founded Standard Oil. Opposite, though, at uh, 25 Broadway, so just to get your bearings, if you're stood at the bull and you're looking south um, towards the face of the bull, the custom house is beyond you. On your left was the um, Standard Oil building and to the right was this building, the Cunard building, built by Benjamin Wister Morris in 1921. It was really the first skyscraper built after the First World War. And because it was built for Cunard, I kind of always felt that it's this strange amalgamation of um, being an American skyscraper, but also having a lot of kind of Edwardian sensibilities that you'd find in London. And as beautiful as it is, it's not as dramatic as the Standard Oil building from the outside. It's actually quite limited to the amount of um, decoration and sculpture. What you do get over the entrance of these beautiful keystones with Poseidon being flanked by the four winds. But the real magic of this building is when you step inside. And so first of all, you step into um, this wonderful lobby. Anybody who watches the John Wick movies will recognize this as the lobby from the New York Continental Hotel. And then before you proceed into the ticketing hall, these beautiful screens um, by Samuel Yellen. The ceiling, again, is all faux painted. It almost looks like it's out of terracotta, but it's beautifully faux painted with this nautical theme of sea monsters and crabs and tridents. But you pass through these screens into what is perhaps the most surprising space in New York City, which is the, um, the grand ticketing hall. Um, it's now operated by Cipriani's, but uh, back in 1996, when I first discovered this, there was a little post office right in the middle of that. It looked like a spaceship had just landed inside. And it's obviously built upon, um, um, based upon the um, the baths of Caracalla and the baths of ancient Rome. Um, it's 185 feet long, 65 feet tall. Trinity Church could just about fit inside the space. That's just how big it is. And it has this just beautiful ceiling that to me feels like it's a uh, an old Persian rug and in the pendentives which are, which are the triangular portions before you get to the dome um, there's depictions of uh, Leif Erikson, Sebastian Cabot, Christopher Columbus and Sir Francis Drake. Now most of the murals which were painted during this period were actually painted in the artist studio on uh, fabric and then installed later on, much like you would install wallpaper nowadays. This is the exception. This was actually painted on top of scaffolding and it was painted by a gentleman called Ezra Winter. And he was able to actually finish this in just a mere four months. And very sad story with Ezra Winter. Uh, a number of years later, he fell off, uh, off a ladder, hurt his hand, wasn't able to hold a paintbrush anymore. and ended up um, committing suicide. But directly below from the dome, if you look up, you look down, is this beautiful bronze seal um, by John Gregory, which depicts the ship 
the land, the sea, and the sky. And then just quickly moving uptown, this is our little tour of Cass Gilbert, uh, serendipitously. So this, we saw it a little bit earlier, sneak shot. This is Madison Square Garden designed by Stanford White, which is on the northeast corner of Madison Square, which is where Madison Square Garden gets, gets its name. Um, took up an entire block between Madison and Park Avenues and 26 and 27th Street, um, built in the Moorish style uh, with this wonderful tower based on uh, La Guelda in Seville, uh, which dates back to the, to the 12th century. And then on top of it was a scandalously nude sculpture of Diana um, by Augustus St. Gordon's. And on top of this building is where Stafford White would, would famously uh, be murdered in 1906 by, by Harry Four. But the building itself was a commercial failure. It, the mortgage was seized by the bank and it would be demolished in 1925. The bank which seized the, uh, the mortgage was the New York Life Insurance Company building, who would build its headquarters in the same um, location. And they would hire Cass Gilbert. And they would go to him and say, you know, we actually want the Cathedral of Life Insurance, not the Cathedral of Commerce. And so he would do this in 1928. But the first thing he tried to do was actually have the tower um, relocated. And he actually wanted to have it relocate the the Tower of Madison Square Garden. He wanted to have it relocated to go up to the NYU campus in the Bronx. I showed you the picture earlier of the, the uh, Gould Memorial Library. They wanted to place it next to them. That wasn't economically feasible, so it was demolished. So the next thing he tried to do was actually base his design for this building on that tower. And the reason for doing this was he had actually worked at McKimmead and White. He had been Stanford White's um, primary draftsman. And so I had a great deal of respect for White and uh, didn't want to just tear down um, one of his architectural masterpieces. But the New York Life Insurance Company built a uh, company didn't want that. They wanted their cathedral of, of life insurance. And so this is what you get. And um, the spire is actually inspired by um, the Octagonal Spire at Salisbury Cathedral. It's 40 floors tall, it's 617 feet tall, and it has over a million square feet of office space. This was the modern skyscraper. And it doesn't have the same amount of detail that you get on um, the Woolworth building, but it does have some beautiful carving um, on it, limited, but beautiful. And part of that was, you know, potentially to save on money, but the building is sheathed in limestone, which was not inexpensive. But mainly because we're kind of, this was 1928, we're getting into the Art Deco period, we're getting into modernism. And so you get this kind of funny kind of blend at that time. Um, another one of the buildings, which is that funny blend, is the Union Club on Park Avenue, where the outside of it looks like an Italian palazzo, but inside has got all these Art Deco details. And this building has that as well. And you can get that kind of by looking at um, the facade of it when you compare that to the Woolworth building and the intricacy of the Woolworth building. Uh, this is much more streamlined. And this is what um, Cass Gilbert would call of gothic perpendicular he would call this american perpendicular and just to the, the size of this building it has 2180 windows and it's two entrances are on park avenue and um, madison avenue identical entrances you go in for these beautiful gates for this beautiful archway this is actually the entrance which is on madison um but you walk into this beautiful entrance lobby which which spans the two entrances and uh, interesting little thing here is most people assume that Manhattan's flat it's not there's quite a big level change between Park Avenue and Madison Avenue so when you look uh, west towards Madison you they didn't want to put steps in here and so it's ramped and so you kind of get this strange uh, perspective as you look through the whole block of this building. Um, 
has this beautiful ceiling. We go from a flat carpet to a vaulted carpet. It has these um, um, beautiful, 18 of these beautiful light fixtures. Um, the walls were clad in travertine. And when this first opened, the, the statue of Diana that used to be on top of Madison Square Garden was displayed here in the lobby of this building before it was later moved um, to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And this is the last image. Um, anybody who wants to take the four, actually the six train, because it's not an express stop, the six train, you can catch the six train here, in which I think is, is, is the nicest entrance with, to a subway stop. And this kind of, um, as we started off the, this little talk with showing you the voice pipes, um, and now you get buildings which um, are straddling subway lines. It just kind of goes to show you in what a short period of time in the space of one generation, how uh, architecture and technology um, changed. And that's it. Thank you, Philip. Uh, and we're here now for some discussion. Uh, we have, I have um, taken a quick look at the participants uh, on the Zoom on this, on this call now, and I see many colleagues who are architecture historians. I see many um, members of the Skyscraper Museum who I know are great enthusiasts for uh, the kind of um, resplendent architecture that you've been showing us. Uh, so let me remind people that you can direct questions to the Skyscraper Museum in chat, and those will be relayed to me, and I'll introduce them into our discussion. But um, let me start off by um, asking you, Philip, to, to talk a little bit more about the process of making the book. I know that you have many monographs under your belt, so you have a great deal of experience in organizing uh, the materials and the kind of game plan or the military strategy of, of, of putting together uh, a, a massive book and a, a coffee table size uh, book uh, as, as these, this one and some of the others are. So organizing material, making the selections, finding the collaborator. But the, um, just give us a window into the process of what comes before the printing. Sure, so I, you know, I, I've known John, um, photographer for a long time. And it kind of just started off. He'd done a number of books already, uh, monographs on the and White and, and other architects. And it was kind of, you know, what building did you not photograph? And we realized there was all these monographs, but no kind of broader book. Um, Henry Hope Reed, who I mentioned earlier, had, had done a book in the 70s, but it was quite a thin pamphlet and um, black and white and just really one page per building. And from the get-go, we wanted to do a book that was large in format so that the photography could sing, so we could have full page images, double page images, so you could see a lot of this detail in its glory. And the other thing we wanted to do was just feature just 20 buildings. We didn't want to cram too much in it. We wanted to um, feature a few buildings, but in detail. So that then allowed us to have buildings like the Frick Collection, the University Club, and have over 30 pages just to those individual buildings. And um, then we kind of, you know, we got, you get permission to go to some buildings, you, get, you don't get permission to go to others, and you start trying to put them together and to tell this narrative. And very early on, we decided we wanted to show the buildings chronologically. And so you're telling a story. So it's 20 individual chapters, but it's a story that, that continues all the way through. And so in some cases, buildings were chosen, maybe not so much because they're what we consider one of the 20 best buildings, but because it really fit in very well with the narrative that we wanted to tell. And one of those buildings would be the New York Life Insurance Company building. It allowed us to, it allowed me to one, talk about Stanford White and his murder, and two, really how you ending the period kind of going into, into kind of art deco and modernism. And so it was a good kind of way to end the building. And at the very beginning of the building, we have the National Arts Club, which was the old Samuel Tilden mansion, which again, really isn't a Beaux-Arts building, 
but it allowed us to talk about how how and Tilden was one of the founders of New York Public Library, so it led into talking about New York Public Library. We could talk about Boss Tweed, and so this isn't just an architecture book. It's 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 a it's a New York history book. It's a it's a photography book, but it's social. It's also a social history book. And so the buildings are really the backdrop to the stories that are being told about the Astors and the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and J.P. Morgan and Otto Kahn and Jay Gould. And so that's why um, uh, we ended up with the buildings that we did. We also didn't want a lot of repetition. So we only wanted one club. And once the university club said, yes, well, you know, that's it. It's the best club in the city architecturally. Um, and so some answers were very um, easy. I'll just tell you a little quick story. Um, I wanted desperately to include the uh, Brooklyn Trust, which is a bank building on Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights. And I wanted to do that because it was the favorite building of Henry Hope Reed, uh, the historian I mentioned. And also when I first moved to New York, I lived in Brooklyn Heights and it's where I was, it was my local bank. And so it had a great deal of sentimental value. And we got permission from the landlord to photograph it, but they said you need permission from Chase Bank um, because they still operate the banking hall. And I probably spent about two years um, dealing with them, getting nowhere. And then out of sheer desperation, Hail Mary, I went on the internet and I typed in, what is Jamie Dimon's email address? And I just sent an email. And within an hour, I'm in touch with the head of PR at Chase and we've got permission to go and photograph it. Wow. Which is just funny how that happened. Mm -hmm. The Hail Marys do work sometimes. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, well, talk a little bit more about the, the actual um, photography shoots and how much arrangement needed to be done after the permission was, was uh, achieved. So, so I guess they kind of fall into a few different categories. So with the, um, a lot of the buildings, um, we were allowed, access, they, they're not open during the day. So the Cunard building would be one. Uh, we were allowed access during the, just one day's photo shoots when they were closed to the public. Other buildings like New York Public Library and actually the, the U.S. Custom House, we had to go back to several times because they're open every day. And we had this little window between 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. And two hours really isn't enough to, for a shoot. So we had like, I think, four visits to each one of those. Uh, the Frick Collection, one of the few places that was closed uh, on a Monday's. So they let us in on a Monday and um, to photograph when no one was there. Same thing with Grant's tomb. We were allowed in on a Monday when they were closed and we were escorted with a, uh, a park ranger. Other buildings like University Club or Grand Central, you know, you just have to work around what is there. They're never closed. And the the Metropolitan Club is one of my, not the Metropolitan Club, so the Metropolitan Museum is one of my favorite stories. Um, we were allowed to go there, I think at six o'clock in the morning before they opened to the public and were given until 10 o'clock, just one visit to get in and get out. And um, we, um, we go through the staff entrance at the North and the security guards say to us, oh, you're here to photograph. And we're used to metal detectors and IDs and all sorts of things. And we said, yeah, and they went, okay, in you come. And they just let us in and they were escorting goes through the bowels of the, of the Met. And I'm thinking to myself, um, did they not see the Thomas Crown affair? <laughs> or it tells you what kind of cameras must have been on them. <laughs> but, uh, but we go into the Great Hall at 6 a.m. in the morning to photograph it, which is the image on the front of the New York Landmarks book. And we, couldn't, we realized we couldn't photograph it. Up until that point, we'd made an effort to have no people in any of the buildings especially the interiors. And we couldn't do it because you lost all sense of scale. That's just how big the space was. And so we photographed elsewhere and then came back a couple of hours later when they were having a few private tours. And so we could have some people in the space. And so, so each, each shoot was really the fun, the fun part of, 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 of doing a book. Um, the laborious part was doing all the research and, and doing the writing 
And uh, I think I mentioned this to you before, my, my favorite part of the book was actually, and this is the architect in me, was actually the design of the book and laying it out. And um, the, the key to that was not giving the forward by Julian Fellows to the publisher until I had approved every single page. And that's when I handed over the forward. What about the amount of equipment that you needed to, to bring to the photo shoots? Were, was there lighting uh, or is everything with the available light? So some buildings, we did have lighting, others we didn't. So like the Cunard building, lighting's no good. It's too big a space. Um, small spaces, we did. So especially detail shots, um, often John would have, and that's what Lester would help us with, was the, um, was the lighting. When you're really working in a big space, um, you can't do that. And I'm not going to pretend to be a photographer, but... Um, John basically takes multiple shots of different exposures and then blends them all together in Photoshop to get the final image. Um, and, um, you know, by the end of the day, you'd be absolutely shattered because a lot of the time you just stood on marble all day long, uh, which isn't good for your back. And I learned, so the, the shot of the Cunard building when you were looking up, I learned that um, John hated those shots. The real backbreakers to be on the ground looking up. So I soon learned that I had to get him, if I wanted a shot like that, I had to get him to take it in the morning because after lunch, he became much more, much more crankier and <laughs> less likely to want to take that shot. Maybe special pillows or something. <laughs> Maybe, Maybe. pillows next time. Back pillows. Um, well, th those are all really fascinating details. I, I wonder if you could, uh, because you're an architect and, and uh, practicing uh, creating residential, high-end residential architecture, bespoke after all is the name um, of your firm, uh, where materials and discerning clients and um, a certain uh, attitude really about the architecture is 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 part of the of the process. Could you talk about your own kind of communication with the buildings in the in the selection, in the appreciation, in the in the shots that you knew that you wanted to feature in the book in order to communicate your understanding of the architecture? So I'll, I'll tell you something. I didn't do. I intentionally didn't do any research on a building until after we photographed it because I didn't want to go in with a preconceived, okay, we've got to do this, this, and this because somebody else had previously written about this, this, and this. I wanted to go in with my eyes open and, and, and look at the building and dissect it. And in my head stood there, figure out the story that we wanted to tell. And so, um, so that was kind of, conscious is you know and I think that's where you know being an architect kind of um gives you that visual kind of training to know what to look for and what not to look for and again I only do residential um and partly for that is because there really is a resurgence in in traditional and classical architecture in the residential market because people associate their home with traditional family values they want their homes to fit in to the communities in which they live, whether that be a colonial style house up here in the Northeast, or if you're down in Florida where I do a lot of work in Palm Beach, it could be Anglo-Caribbean or it could be Spanish Mediterranean because that's what the architectural fabric of those communities are. And one of the things I love, especially about working in Palm Beach is the big architect down there, historically, um, Addison Meisner, before he was an architect, he was a stage set designer. And so you're really creating stage sets for people to live their lives in. And just, just very quickly, when Harry Ford, who, who murdered Stanford White, when he was let out of the lunatic asylum, he went on a, um, a world tour. He goes down to Palm Beach and he looks at one of Meisner's buildings and he says, I shot the wrong architect. <laughs> um, but anyway, but so, but I think when it comes to people's workplaces, they feel like they've got to be cut on, on the cutting edge of technology and, 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 and moving forward. So that's why you don't see a lot of commercial 
and uh, institutional buildings being built in the traditional style anymore, but you do very much in, in houses, just a very different scale. Now, having said that, five of the buildings in the book, when they were built, were houses. So that's, you know, really is a um, um, an important kind of aspect. They were trying to, they want, they wanted to build in an architecture which would tell the world what they wanted to know the world should know about them. And so just as, as Frank Woolworth wanted the world's tallest building for publicity purposes, um, other people like Otto Kahn wanted his mansion to be based on um, um, the Chancellor in, in Rome, which is uh, a Renaissance palazzo, because he had he was considered himself a, a Renaissance man. He had this great um, art collection, and that was a story that, that they wanted to tell. I wonder if you could talk to about materiality and your appreciation of the buildings. Well, I, I suppose the, the phrase or the characterization of a stage set suggests a kind of superficiality or a kind of pastiche of, of style versus the way I think that most um, people um, feel a, a kind of, in, the, in landmark buildings, a kind of nostalgia for a lost craftsmanship, right? Something which is entirely authentic in its materiality. So I wonder if, if you saw the range um, in, the, in the buildings that you selected, or again, as an architect, if you had a particular uh, attitude or appreciation of the, the examples that you did select. So you get, um, so one, one interesting building is the, is the, uh, the Morgan Library. And JP Morgan was desperate to have Charles McKim design the library for him. He'd had enough of working with Stanford White, uh, famously said Stanford White is almost, is always crazy. And so wanted McKim to do it. And McKim kind of knew this so he could get away with whatever he wanted to do. And when most people think of a masonry building, um, people, you know, lay people mistake, you know, when you see the mortar in between courses, mortar is not glue, it's not there to hold them together, it's to create a level bed, because the stones never level, to create a level bed, to re-level each course as it goes up. And Charles McKim decided with the Morgan Library, he wanted to build it without any mortar at all, he wanted just solid blocks of stone. And uh, that's the way that they that they built the um, um, the uh, the Parthenon in Athens. That's a, and there's very few buildings which are actually. I actually think um, the old Custom House Federal Hall is built that way as well. Uh, you can literally just about stick a a blade in between them. So it's the very definition of, of load bearing masonry where the walls are tremendously thick. Then you get. Um, you know, buildings like New York Public Library. It took 16 years to complete New York Public Library. The Frick Collection went up in less than two years because it's steel framed and all the technology in the world that was going on. I, 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 I didn't write about it, but I know the, the Empire State Building went up in a tremendously short period of time because um, and that's what they were able to do. Now that they had steel, they were just cladding. They didn't have to be building um, you know, load-bearing masonry buildings. So the buildings were no longer what we call tectonic. Um, it really was just cladding. And so whether it be a, a classical skyscraper, like the Standard Oil Building, or a Gothic skyscraper, like um, the Woolworth Building, it really is just, you know, um, stage set design and a story that you want to that particular person to tell. And, you know, residential architecture is no different than that. If you look at uh, Anglo-Caribbean style architecture, it's basically just G Georgian architecture that has been adopted for the tropics uh, with a high, uh, uh, with, with a, a deep roof overhang so that when it rains, it expels the water further away and keeps, um, shades the house as well and painted white to reflect the sun. And so you adapt, things to where you are. And, you know, in the Gilded Age, um, buildings went up fast and buildings came down fast. 
and um, there wasn't a sense of preservation. If the building was too small, they docked it down and they rebuilt something. Very often buildings stood, stood for less than 10 years. Um, and I think, you know, when we think of it now, we think of all the great landmarks that have been lost and been replaced with kind of very nondescript buildings. Um, the Singer building, one with the, you know, US Steel building is, you know, quite nondescript. Um, but every now and again, a great building is replaced by an even better building. So the Waldorf Astoria was stuck down and replaced by the Empire State Building. And the Lennox Library, which was um, Richard Morris Hunt's great masterpiece, was knocked down and replaced by the Frick Collection, which is an infinitely better building than what the Lennox Library ever was. And so, um, I don't know how we segued into preservation here, but it's a comp that's, that's a complex thing. And New York's always in a state of construction. And so I, I, I don't have an issue with, with the sense of it being facadism because you got that in England. I, the, the school I went to, the Prince Wells Institute, was in a building that was designed by Sir John Nash faced onto Regent's Park. And that was just a lesson in facadism. It was a, it was a backdrop to Regent's Park. Once you moved to the parts of the building which didn't face onto the park, there was nowhere near the detail in, included. And so I think it's very, um, may not be academically rigorous to say this, but I think, you know, for me, there's nothing wrong with facadism. And once you build, build with a steel structure, that's what it becomes. Mm -hmm. Well, you clearly have a passion for these buildings and for um, for, for telling stories about them. Uh, we're at the end of our hour, and so maybe uh, I should ask the cliched question at the end here. Um, given how much you've already explored of classical architecture and American Renaissance, what's your next project? What's your next passion? <sighs> so I I always feel like when it comes to the writing, I feel like, you know, Al Pacino in the good, in the, in the Godfather part three, when he says, just when you think you're out, they pull you back in again. Um, I think my better half, Teresa, would be happier if I wrote a novel and maybe made some money for a change because uh, these types of books don't pay the mortgage. Um, my architectural work does. These, these books are done really for fun. And like I said, unless, unless Tom Cruise buys the movie rights, I'm really not making any money from this. So, I think she would like me to write a novel and try and make some money for a change. Um, and I, that would be fun. And you know, the interesting thing with this is halfway through this book, we decided that we went to the publisher and we said, we've got so much material, we could do this in two volumes. And um, they said, no, they didn't want to do that because uh, they didn't think that volume twos sold very well because people don't buy volume two unless they purchase the volume one. And if we'd have done that, we would have still gone chronologically and stopped in the middle so we could continue our story. Because we didn't do that, I often get asked, well, if you do another book, um, what other, you know, other Beaux-Arts buildings would, would go in it? And I don't think we can do it because, again, it's not just really a book about 20 individual chapters. It's this long reaching storyline that spans the entire book and so that kind of makes it impossible to to go back and do a, a volume two when it comes to this well maybe uh with julian fellows you'll be able to cash in on uh, on a, a wave of enthusiasm for the gilded age uh and to collaborate again on something that that enlarges the audience uh you know well well beyond the aficionados of, of architecture. Um, so thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm, I'm seeing some thank yous on, on, the, on the chat, which I communicate to you directly from, from the audience, but it really was fun to hear both the mechanics um, of the creation of, of, of the book and the you know, strategy that you brought to creating it along with the you know, the great love and enthusiasm that you have for the, the buildings themselves. So um, we thank you for being with us tonight and um, wish you the best of luck with, with, with the next 
next chapter in the next volume, um, as well as with creating um, the new the new set of uh, residential um, traditional uh, landmarks that um, where where you focus your 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 own uh, kind of constructive energy. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first of our two March book talks. This is kind of a, a bonus round and a, and a special preview because when I learned about this book from um, Philip James Dodd, our author and speaker for this evening, um, about his book, An American Renaissance, Bozar Architecture in New York City, uh, it seemed a perfect prologue to an effort that we have been working on at the museum for the last three or four months, uh, an exhibition on the landmarks of New York that will open in May. And so uh, the early landmarks of the ninth, late 19th century and early 20th century, which are covered in highlights in 20 featured buildings in this big coffee table book, um, a beautiful book. I'm not holding it up for you because it's the size of a coffee table, quite heavy, uh, available at uh, fine bookstores everywhere, or certainly you can also order it um, from a bookseller, including um, with a discount on Amazon, I have to confess. Uh, a book that is uh, a kind of um, mat weighty uh, topic uh, equaled by the splendid beauty of the um, production of, of the book and in the uh, photographs that you can see here in the cover. Uh, the um, book is part text and, um, and lavishly illustrated, extravagantly illustrated in an architecture which is highly um, extravagant. The Beaux-Arts architecture of New York as uh, Philip likes um, to title it, but uh, an architecture of the Gilded Age of great affluence, um, the era of uh, wealth and power in New York that was communicated in both civic institutions and in private residences um, that are um, summarized and well glimpsed, but also summarized in, in this book and, and a whole range of building types. Um, I'm going to introduce Philip in a moment, but um, he will be focusing especially on the skyscrapers uh, in that are um, that are featured in, in the book uh, tonight, uh, and that is this kind of prelude to the exhibition that we're calling Skymarks Landmarks. Um, they are the individual designated landmarks in New York City that we consider skyscrapers. And they're about 84 by our count. Um, and about four or five of them will be, will be shown um, in these um, great photographs tonight. Now, this work is the brainchild of Philip Dodd, who has done previous books that I'll show you the covers of um, in, uh, in just a moment. He himself is an architect uh, as well as an author. He also teaches a number of different schools, different, different different uh, courses, uh, and is a, a, a very energetic producer of monographs and of these kind of compendium that celebrate the architecture, especially of the classical tradition and the Beaux-Arts tradition and the kind of traditional um, architecture that he was schooled in, uh, in, born in the UK. He went to architecture school in Manchester, the city of his birth, um, also in London at um, the, um, the Prince Charles's Institute for, uh, for, for Architecture, where he studied classical architecture. And he's very devoted in his um, own work uh, in a firm that he calls by his name, Philip James Dodd, bespoke uh, residential uh, design. Uh, where he designs whole buildings as well as interiors um, in this uh, in a stylistic approach uh, in which he is deeply um, invested, as you will see tonight. I'll show you a couple of other uh, covers of um, two of his previous books, um, The Classical American House, uh, as well as uh, this, the um, art of classical details, so that you can see that Philip is uh, is someone who 
who appreciates and closely studies both the in, the details, but also the context. And he's going to describe his approach um, to, to the book and the focus on these individual uh, structures and, and interiors and how he wanted to capture them in the context of the Gilded Age. Uh, another person, or actually two people or three people who did that with him are um, his photographer, uh, Jonathan Wallen, and um, Julian Fellows, who is, I think, well known to anyone who watches PBS and has been addicted as I was for many years um, to Downton Abbey, um, and now in the an HBO American version of uh, the, um, the Gilded Age, uh, a writer and producer of uh, of storytelling in the Kant and the uh, and the celebration of architecture in this kind of great context of uh, of the built world um, as a, as the social scene as a, and as a social setting. So um, Philip is going to talk about that with the bi with the biographies of some of the architects uh, that created these works we're focusing on. I do want to mention, um, in addition to his collaborators in, in um, the photographer um, Jonathan Whalen, and also Julian, um, an essay by Richard Guy Wilson uh, on the architecture of the Gilded Age, the architectural historian. Um, Richard Wilson. So let me invite Philip to come on to the screen now. As soon as I um, remind myself to tell you um, of these other two um, points, one is that you can find on our website one of the few books um, it, that has been written about interior landmarks in New York. And, and Philip's book is going to, and, and tonight's talk is going to show us a lot of gorgeous interior details. Um, now the late Judith uh, Gura and Kate Wood um, talked about the designated landmarks that are interiors um, in this book talk, which is on our website. And I do want to um, let you know that next Tuesday, um, in a moment, uh, we will have um, another top talk on an entirely different topic, the roots of the urban renaissance and a focus on Harlem and community development from the 1960s on. So I invite you to come back um, next Tuesday night um, for that talk by Brian Goldstein. Now, I, I, I wanted to show this clipping, uh, which is an editorial from the New York Times, uh, probably written by Ada Louise Huxtable, I imagine, in 1974. And uh, it makes the point uh, that in 1974, when in fact the Landmarks Law was amended in order to include interiors and the first interiors like the New York Public Library's great entr entrance foyer uh, was designated, uh, that there were, uh, there were very few uh, skyscrapers that had yet to be, that had been designated for protection by the Landmarks Law. And some of the ones we're gonna talk about tonight, and just to read from this clipping, which you probably can't see that well, um, it, uh, she, someone talks about the spectacular Great Hall of the Cunard Building in Lower Manhattan, um, which is then un undesignated, which will be, and she says, good news, uh, will be taken over by the Postal Service um, so that this magnificently embellished interior can again serve a useful public purpose. Uh, and she goes on to mention that the that um, the great icons of New York, like the Woolworth Building, Chrysler, Empire State, Rockefeller Center, were not yet protected by a landmarks law that had been put in place a decade previous. So, um, Part of the of our discussion um, tonight and our upcoming exhibition is about the continuing life of these buildings, um, treasures um, of their time, highly um, uh, elaborate and expensive uh, creations that had to find new uses. And the Postal Service being one that I remember well myself and in an earlier um, discussion uh, uh, pre-call, Philip and I were talking about how um, he used to go to mail a letter on Saturdays in the post office uh, branch that was in the Cunard building here on the, the um, base of Lower Broadway on tw at 26 Broadway. So keeping these buildings alive is, a, is very challenging. Landmarking is one way in order to protect them, uh, but finding an economic purpose from them gives them a new, new life. And unless they have that um, continuing um, uh, economic lifeblood, um, these, these buildings can't survive. So um, thank you for everybody for joining us tonight and um, find 
uh, Philip's book in uh, Rizzoli and uh, museums, uh, bookshops, and uh, even uh, through your uh, online purveyors of, of good books. So thanks, everybody. Um, uh, enjoyed the evening, and thank you for, for being with us tonight. Thanks, Philip. Thank you very much.